Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're not fed up with AI, LLMs, generative AI. I think it's a big theme this year, right? Uh, so today, uh, I'm happy to uh, be uh, another one, another speaker speaking about this uh, generative AI theme today. In practice, uh, with some concrete demos and examples, uh, we'll be using uh, the Palm and Gemini models from uh, Google Cloud, from Google. Uh, and I'm, so my name is Guillaume Laforge, I'm a developer advocate at Google Cloud, but I'm also a Java champion. And uh, I've wanted for, uh, since the beginning of this uh, new trend, uh, to play with LLMs, but in Java, of course, I'm a Java developer. Um, so I'm going to show that using Java. A bit of groovy, maybe uh, some uh, of you may know me for, uh, I'm the co-founder of the Apache Groovy programming language. So there's one example that's going to be in Groovy, but otherwise the rest will be in Java. And I'll also be using, uh, in some of my examples and demos, I'll be using the wonderful Longchain 4J uh, projects. All right, so let's start. I'll start with a few notions and uh, vocabulary, etc., so that we're all on the same page. So when we speak about LLMs, where do they fit in in the big picture? So there's the biggest uh, potato or <laughs> uh, square there, the artificial intelligence. They are within, there's machine learning, where we try to teach the machines uh, how to learn from data, different kinds of approaches to that. Then we've got what is called deep learning, that's when we use uh, neural networks, and why deep? Because there are tons of layers of neurons, so that's deeply, you know, uh, nested layers of neurons. And again, there are different architectures for the neural networks, uh, convol convolutional neural net networks, recurrent neural networks, etc. And uh, we also speak about data science. It's not just about artificial intelligence, it's also about you know, cleaning, preparing data. It's not necessarily purely uh, AI. So there are other tax tasks that are outside of the scope of uh, AI itself. Let's continue to zoom in. Then we have generative AI, the, the latest uh, thing, uh, the latest focus. Uh, again, with other uh, kind of neural network architectures. So um, uh, variable autoencoders and transformers, that's the one we're going to be interested in. Um, What's why we call that generative? Because we can generate stuff. It's not just for predicting like the outcome of something, like a sentiment analysis or something like this, but you can also generate stuff, images, but also text with what do we call now to, uh, nowadays uh, large language models and a particular neural network architecture called transformers. And LLMs, that's also part of the field of natural language processing, like understanding um, human language and generating human language. So that's the big picture, and we're going to focus on this, uh, what color is it? Uh, purple, violet, whatever you want to call that color. Transformers have been created or invented five, six, six years ago uh, by Google, actually. And uh, Google kept on innovating around the, that theme. Uh, but what's interesting, I think, is the fact that it's only fairly recently that transformer-based neural networks have become, have become popular because, uh, I mean, everybody probably already tried um, ChatGPT, who tried ChatGPT, because that's really the kind of the, the killer app that uh, started the whole revolution there. And uh, who tried Bard? Yeah, okay, not bad. That's an, oh, not barred. <laughs> uh, so that's good. Uh, if you haven't, uh, be sure to try it. It's, uh, it's doing some, some good stuff there. So there have been lots of innovations on how to uh, refine the different kind of transformers with decoders, encoders, or just part of this architecture. But I, I won't bore you with the details of the uh, exact layers of neurons on that kind of stuff. Don't worry. I'm a developer and I want to use those LLMs. Often when you hear about large language models, you'll, you'll hear people say, you know, it's just a kind of a statistical machine that predicts the next word. Okay, but, um, okay, given some text, you give it a, a prompt, then like a question, what is the, the capital of uh, Sweden? What is it going to say next? Should it be, what would you say? 
Okay, good. <laughs> You're good LLMs, right? Uh, but maybe um, you'd like to have a longer answer, like uh, the capital of blah, 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 is blah, blah, blah. Uh, but sometimes those machines, when, when they are the, the, the foundation models without further uh, instruction tuning, often they uh, kind of repeat what they learn. And sometimes if they've been trained on some data set that says, what's the capital of Sweden? What's the capital of France? Maybe it's going to continue with other questions instead of answering. So it's interesting to better understand how uh, it, it's becoming smarter uh, when it's further uh, fine-tuned and trained to answer questions and to better understand the relationship with the, that idea that it's uh, just predicting the next word. And there's this nice um, uh, article from the Financial Times that I'd like to show you. Uh, okay, so here it is. It, it, uh, so I need to go there. So you start the, the first process, uh, first step of the process. When you have a, a sentence, like we go to work by train, there's a step of tokenization. We're going to split the text into smaller chunks. So here, for the sake of this uh, infographics, uh, one word equals one token. But usually, a word can be one token, or it can be uh, two or three tokens if the, the word is less common or if it's a long word. But here, let's keep in mind that it's just one word, one token. So the first step is to split into tokens. So there are models for, for doing that. Then, um, as the model is trained on data sets, on large corpus of data sets and uh, articles, books, etc., there's going to be some analysis of the, the relationships between the words, and it's going to create a, a distribution of probabilities, like the next word often associated with work is something, or, or it's not something else, etc. So you kind of get a distribution of probabilities, of relationships between one word and the next word. And with that, where the, the system is actually building what we call vector embeddings. So it's a multi-dimensional vector, like say, uh, may, maybe uh, 1,000 uh, dimensions uh, in terms of the, you know, the size of the uh, array, containing floating point numbers. And uh, those particular um, numbers uh, represent the, somehow the relationships w with the other tokens that has, have been learned along the, uh, along the process. And what's interesting, so, you know, it's not the, like, the global warming thing, because this one is pretty cold, right? <laughs> so it's, uh, think of it more uh, uh, as of um, some kind of DNA sequence, because what's interesting is when you compare the vector embeddings for, for each token with other uh, vector embeddings for other tokens. And for example, um, let's say sea and ocean, they are similar concepts, right? A vast uh, place with water. And uh, if you look and, and if you try to compare those vectors, you're going to see that, well, there are stripes that seem to be common, like these ones, or football and soccer. Well, maybe in the US, US it might be something different because they, I've heard they play you know, another kind of football, but you know, with hands or something. It's a weird concept. <laughs> Uh, but they seem to be somewhat related, you know, again, the big, dark, red bars, blue bars, etc. And in or, or pronouns, they are similar, you know. And what's interesting is that if you uh, try to do a projection of these vectors, instead of uh, 1,000 dimensions, you do that over two dimensions or three dimensions, you're going to notice, intuitively, we've, alre we've already seen the stripes that are similar, but uh, once you project them together, you're going to see that, yeah, maybe uh, means of transportation are in the same place, or where you study and work, uh, the, all, all those uh, tokens are in the same place, etc. or ways uh, human beings move uh, their body, etc. Um, so, measuring the distance or how similar the vectors are, when you have two vectors uh, of two tokens that are similar, that means that they are semantically linked. So, you can probably, you know, exchange one with another. It would be more or less the same meaning in a sentence, for example. Um, next, there's this one, which is interesting. So let's say I have this sentence, I have no interest in politics. So there's a mechanism called self-attention, so it's 
the way the, the neural network has been designed. So the, the details are not really important. But um, this mechanism is here to um, establish somehow the stronger relationships between certain tokens with other tokens. So interest, the, the word interest, or let's say, uh, I want to show, yeah, this one. So the word interest in this part of the sentence is more linked to, oh no, I thought there was a, another uh, animation before that. Um, so it's trying to uh, see how the one particular word is more tied to another word in the sentence. And it's going to be clear in a moment. So this interest is about, I'm interested in something, right? Uh, but the, the very same word, uh, interest in that other sentence, the bank's interest rate rises, uh, it's, not the, it's not the same thing, right? It's spelled the same way, but it's not the same concept. And uh, here we speak about interest rates, so it's a financial uh, concept, basically. So in this uh, sentence, the first word, you're going to see that, okay, no, because it's negative, is, so as it's darker, it's more related. No is uh, pretty dark because it's related to interest. No interest, it's negative. In hearing, so interest in what in something, it's in hearing, so those are very much related. And even the, the pronoun is uh, somewhat quite blue because it's that person who's got or doesn't uh, have an interest in hearing about something. But if you look at the other interest word, this, one, this time uh, we're going to see that uh, rate is way more, uh, there's a, a stronger uh, bound uh, between interest and rate, interest and bank, rising interest, okay? So it's, uh, and semantically, uh, we know that the first one, interest, because of the overall context, is tied to, uh, well, you're interested in something, and the other, interest, is tied to profits, dividends, and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, this other example, I like it very much. Um, so the dog chewed the bone because it was hungry. Us human being, we understand that uh, who chews that the dog, uh, and the the word uh, eat, the pronoun corresponds to the dog. Okay, so who's hungry? It's the dog, right? You follow me so far? Now. Uh, we're going to change just one word in that sentence. We're going to change a, an adjective, but the pronoun it will be uh, tied to the bone and not the dog. So this time, if you change to say uh, the, the bone because it was delicious, is it the dog that's delicious or is it the bone? But the LNM is able to figure out that the, this is the bone that is delicious. Maybe in some countries, they would say the dog is delicious too. Maybe, okay, but here it's really the bone that is delicious, right? So that gives you um, a glimpse into what uh, large language models are able to, uh, you know, understand and figure out that. Uh, although it's very, it's the, the same grammatical structure, it's just one word that is different, but it understands, uh, depending on the context, that uh, it corresponds to the bone rather than to the dog. All right. Uh, I think I'll skip the rest. Uh, Self-attention. Oh yeah, just one last word is that, uh, so it's not just about predicting the next word, but also uh, in terms of distribution of probabilities. If you've got a chain of words that follow those uh, words, uh, maybe the best answer to or follow-up uh, to the financial times is maybe a newspaper founded in uh, 1888 is a, a better choice. Although all the other uh, alternatives are fine, uh, but this one is more interesting, I guess, when you ask the question, what uh, the final financial time is. All right, so I invite you to have a look at this article. It's uh, very well explained. There was another similar article, uh, I think, in the Guardian newspaper that was uh, quite good at explaining this, uh, this uh, concept. All right, so what are large language models? They are those big black boxes containing uh, large language, uh, um, sorry, um, neural uh, network, deep neural network, which is based on this uh, transformer architecture of neural networks. So those uh, networks are able to recognize, to predict uh, text and generate text and more or less understand text. 
I usually try to avoid saying like they understand as if they are sentient because they are not, but still, that's the word we tend to use. Uh, a bit more vocabulary, when we hear about the size of a model, we speak about uh, parameters. When we say, okay, a palm has got 340 uh, billion parameters, that's actually the number of uh, connections uh, between the neurons of the neural network. And when we say tokens, so we saw what tokens are, but we also measure a model by the size of the corpus that's, that it's been trained on. And so we often say, yeah, it's been trained over 3.6 trillions of tokens, which is, uh, I mean, a human being would need a, maybe their entire life to read uh, that much text, or uh, I think it's in a few decades, like 40 years, to read uh, the same amount of data or something like that. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the exact number, but that, that's the idea. So yeah, these are um, machines that are able to understand the, the relationship between words, phrases, and others able to generate similar uh, um, paragraphs, etc. Another thing but that I won't cover in this presentation, and this, uh, you probably have heard of this as well, fine-tuning. So you can further train a model by fine-tuning the model. So that means training an existing model um, on new corpus of data, or uh, sometimes there are some more efficient ways to fine-tune a model by just training the latest layers uh, of a model. So there's quanti quantizi quantization, etc. There are different mechanisms to optimize and make things uh, less costly because uh, for big language models, uh, it can be you know, millions of dollars to train a full model, but even further fine tuning might be uh, pretty costly. So uh, you may want to use techniques that are uh, more, let's say, optimal um, and give uh, pretty much uh, the similar results. So fine-tuning is another concept you might have heard. Uh, a few more words about the size, the importance of the size of the models. Um, if you look at, so th this is old uh, data here for, from last year, but um, and also bigger vendors and models don't necessarily mention the number of uh, tokens on which they, they've been trained on, like uh, GPT-4, we don't really know the size of this model. Uh, or Gemini, I think Google hasn't uh, said publicly how many, uh, what's the size of that network. But the interesting thing about the model sizes is that the bigger the model, the more capable, capable it is at different tasks. So when you take a small model, uh, it might be good at basic question answering, some small arithmetics questions, but as it grows bigger, it's able to do translation, summarization of text, and even bigger, um, things like understanding jokes or proverbs. Uh, it's able to explain, you give it a joke, it's going to tell you why it's funny, you know. Which is, some, so I'm not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, and sometimes I see some jokes in English, and I'm like, uh, why is it funny? And I tried a few times to, to get explanations of jokes, and it doesn't mean that the joke was really funny in itself, but at least I got the explanation of what it was supposed to be funny. So yeah, uh, bigger models usually are more capable, but uh, we're, we're also seeing a trend towards smaller models because you can, uh, if you train a small model for a very specific task on a very specific data set, but high quality data set, you can have great results even with a small model on specific uh, tasks, like let's say a summarization or something. Um, whereas large language models are able to do very well on a large set of tasks, but sometimes even a smaller model can beat a, a bigger model on a particular task. Um, all right, so just uh, a few words about what's available on Google Cloud, because I'll be using some of this uh, in my demos. Uh, I'm going to use the Palm model that had, has been announced, uh, I think that was two years ago, and there was a revision last year. Uh, yeah, yeah, last year, the Palm 2 model. And then Gemini, the new uh, multimodal model, uh, was released uh, in well mid-December. So it's still fairly new. And uh, I, I was happy to be able to work on the release of the Gemini module uh, and language model. Uh, I worked on the Java samples, on the Java SDK that I'm uh, using in my demos. And also wrapped within a long chain 4J that I'll be using. So those models are also what, uh, what are powering uh, BARD. 
So if you're using Bard, and actually just last week it's been announced that uh, Bard has been upgraded to Gemini. So it's not using Palm anymore, it's using the latest and greatest model from uh, Google. There's also, you might have heard, uh, I've heard about Google AI Studio. It was called Maker Suite before. And it's, all it's a tool, not part of Google Cloud, but that developers can use and play with and get a, a free API key to play with uh, the Gemini model. And I'll be showing you that in a, in a minute. And then, as part of Google Cloud, that's the Vertex AI offering, which contains all the ML stuff provided by Google Cloud. So there's Model Garden that contains tons of models, so the, the Google-specific ones, but also open source or open weights, uh, openly available models like Clama 2, Cloud, uh, Stable Diffusion if you want to generate images, and uh, what else? I think we announced um, Mistral and uh, what was the other one? Yeah, so they, they, there are like 100 or 200 models now that are available. And there's also Kodi for code generation. So this one is from Google and Imagine as well for image generation. Kodi is for um, programming, uh, code completion and that kind of stuff. Um, so again, we'll be using those models directly, but there are also some interesting things that you may want to have a look at potentially. Search and conversation. Search uh, is actually using, on, on conversation, is using vector search. Vector search is a vector database to store vector embeddings, those vectors we saw earlier. And uh, you've got integrations so that you can create a kind of a Google search, search engine on top of vector search, on top of your own documents and conversation to create chatbots. Here I have a demo where I built my own chatbot, but I could have used that as well. The classical machine learning APIs that, that have been avail available for years. And you might have seen also the notebooks uh, you often see, uh, if you're looking at the latest uh, fancy models and so on, you'll often see uh, Jupyter notebooks kind of stuff, and they are often hosted on Google Colab, which is the, 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 the notebooks uh, offered by Google Cloud Vertex AI. So that's it for, let's say, the sales pitch, but I want to put that into picture so that you know uh, what, we're, what we are using today. A few more words before I jump into the demos about Gemini. So that's the latest model that Google released, uh, Google DeepMind. And uh, the, the, the big difference compared to our previous model is that it's a multimodal uh, large language model, which means that it takes not only text, but it can take an input, images, or videos. Um, there are different sizes, Nano, Pro, Ultra. Uh, Nano, you might have heard of this one as well, because Samsung uh, announced that it's uh, now integrated into the latest Samsung Galaxy S whatever, 24 something number. Um, so it's uh, integrated within the device so that it's not calling the cloud or anything. It's really running on the device. So that's a smaller version of Gemini. And uh, today we're, we'll be using uh, mostly uh, Gemini Pro. Uh, in terms of size. The other thing, so I'm not covering it in my demos, but uh, it's a feature that I like mentioning, that's function calling. Um, a, a, an LLM is trained on a corpus of data, and its training has stopped, let's say, uh, maybe uh, uh, a few months ago. So it's going to be refreshed maybe every, I don't know, quarter, six months, or whatever. Uh, but the, in terms of knowledge, the, um, you know, the model knows what happened till a certain date, but the latest news, maybe it doesn't know about this. If you use tools like BARD, it may be using Google search to search the latest information, etc. But the Gemini model, I don't know when was the... So I think the last... Uh, um, I don't know when it was trained. I mean, the, the end of the last training uh, period. But that, that's probably like uh, uh, in December when we announced it, I guess. I don't know exactly the date, the cutoff date. But function calling is a way to instruct the LLM um, so let's say, I'll give you a, an example to, to clarify this. Um, let's say you're going to ask the LLM, what's the weather in Stockholm tomorrow? Of course, it's not part of the training set, right? Because, you know, we're not training on future data, right? So instead, we can tell the LLM that, uh, well, if someone asks you about uh, the weather, there's a function that can be called. So you describe the function, the parameters, etc. There's a location parameter that you can fill in with the name of the city. And then, um, the, actually, the, the model figures out, oh yeah, I need to call this function, or this function needs to be called. I'll use the, the passive uh, form, uh, because 
it's not the LLM that's going to call the function, but you, as a developer who integrates the LLM within your application, you're going to say, OK, uh, you want me to call that function, so I'm going to call the function myself, and I'm going to feed the LLM the answer. So it tells me, uh, please call that function for me with, uh, so the function get weather forecast, location Stockholm, and then me, the developer integrating it, I'm going to call that you know, REST API or whatever, and I'm going to return, OK, I call the API, it says tomorrow it's going to be sunny in Stockholm, I give the response to the LLM, and the LLM is then going to answer in a, this time text uh, form, of course, yeah, it's going to be sunny tomorrow uh, in, uh, in Stockholm. So function calling is a super uh, useful way to extend an LLM with uh, real-time data or potentially to create uh, some kind of agents. So you, um, I've got a... Uh, I don't know if he already did his talk. There's a Sebastian Blanc who was telling me about a demo he's working on where uh, he integrates that with uh, a Kubernetes cluster and he, the, the function calls are actually going to say, okay, uh, uh, deploy that uh, container on that pod or that kind of things. So you could imagine agents that uh, have some actions and not just about requesting some data. All right, so that's it for uh, Gemini, and uh, it's time for me to show you some demos. So I like to start with a few examples of uh, prompt engineering and such uh, in Bard, in uh, Maker Suite or uh, Google AI Studio, we changed the name recently. So let me show you that. Uh, we'll start with, um, oh yeah, and something important I want to stress. Um, so this is Google AI Studio, formerly called uh, Maker Suite, and it's funny because the, it's still part of the URL. But um, there's one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, it's hallucinations. You've probably all heard about hallucinations. And sometimes you can trick an LLM to hallucinate even more. So you kind of uh, phrase differently your questions. For example, I'm going to ask the old Palm model that doesn't have all the same guardrails and integration as in BARD uh, with Gemini, etc. So, uh, and I'll ask you the, the question uh, as, as well. What is the name of the first cat who stepped on the moon? Do you know what's the name of the first cat who went on the moon? Anyone? Uh, you kind of hesitate, right? The name is... Felicet, did you know that? Right? So I'm going, so honestly, I'm using Palm 2. If I used uh, Gemini, uh, it wouldn't give the same answer. But let me ask the same question to Gemini via Bard, but which has been um, further fine tuned to, uh, for accuracy and that kind of stuff. So although it's the same base models that are used under the hood, the way you integrate them, etc., might give different results. So if I say this, what is the name of the first cat who stepped on the moon? And it's, of course, going to say, -ba -dam, no cat ever walked on the moon. However, a cat, a brave cat, named Felicet flew into space. And I'm French, it's a French cat, actually. <laughs> so there was really a cat who went in space, but not on the moon. And the, the, the cat was indeed called uh, Felicet. And the, the other cool thing I like actually about BART is the fact that you can also click on the little G Google search button, and it's going to correlate the generated answers uh, with results that exist on Google search, basically. So you can be more, let's say, uh, certain that it's a factual answer or that, you know, the, the question was too vague or there's not much uh, data available on a particular topic. So hallucination, keep that in mind, can give interesting results. But, uh, okay, I kind of forced the model to say, hey, what's the name of the cat? As if it was true, there was a cat that went on the moon, but, well, no. So it's a, it's a bad trick that I'm playing on, uh, on it. Uh, I'd like to show you another interface, so that's similar to Google AI Studio slash Maker Suite. So when you're using Google Cloud Platform, you also have a similar... Um, Whoops, you also have a similar interface, <laughs> a dark screen. It's a super cool interface when uh, you want to. So I don't know if I should like plug and plug or do something to get it back. Uh, I had that happen to me once. Let me unplug and replug just to be sure. 
Okay, let's try again. Uh, I've heard it's um, kind of bug in, well, not a bug, but it's a feature, I guess, for uh, Mac OS to, um, when you switch between full screen and uh, like normal screen mode, uh, there's uh, encryption or DRM applied or not applied, and uh, they, they are afraid of not showing the, um, like uh, if, you're, if, I was, if I were playing a movie or something for corporate infringement. Hello again. Well, maybe I should use the like USB-C stuff or what? What do you advise me to do? So I'm using HDMI. Yeah, try this. Okay, so I'm gonna plug this then. Uh, okay. Maybe it's better with USB-C. Sorry for this. Oops, <laughs> don't want to make everything fall. So, is it coming back? Ah, my screen moved, so it should be coming back. So I see it on the control screen, and <gasps> suspense! Yes! Oh! Woohoo! Best demo effect ever. Well, the other thing um, I'd like to mention, I, I like to give that example, um, which is as a Java, well, not just Java, but as a developer, when I integrate a large language model in my application, I, I want to do things that um, may be complicated, with, um, yeah, complicated without using something like an LLM, but without having to have a PhD in uh, natural language processing, etc. So, for example, uh, today, um, in terms of data, uh, maybe 20% only of the data. So I've, I've read a paper that was saying giving that kind of figures. 20% of the data is structured in databases, uh, spreadsheets, uh, CSV files, etc., or JSON files. But uh, more than 80% of the data is actually unstructured in the shape of articles, books, etc. And for example, that's something that I like to, you to show us uh, an example. It's um, I, you want to do d data extraction. So let's say um, uh, give the name, the role, the company of the person described in the following biography. Okay, and I'm going to copy and paste like my uh, bio here. Okay, I'm pasting that here. Oop, there's even, uh, I don't think I need the uh, bold text and so on. And it's going to say, okay, name, given a phone, role, developer advocate, company, Google Cloud, that's correct. But I, I could say, okay, give the name, the role, the company of the person uh, as, oops, as a JSON, JSON document. Uh, okay, let's see if that works that way. And it's going, and I can define the schema more precisely, etc. but it's able to, to return JSON. So as a developer, I can call an API, send some text, and in return, I get a proper JSON object that I can work with, marshal and marshal, etc., to my own uh, pojos and beans and so on. So I think that's quite par powerful. Um, another thing uh, I could show you, I'll erase that. Uh, when you do few shot prompting, it means that you're going to give some examples to the LLM to frame the answer or to give a better um, how to steer the model to answer in the, in the way you want. Um, so, for example, if you want to do text classification, sentiment analy analysis, you could do this. I'll take a, another example instead of those classical ones. It's um, given um, an ingredient, suggest a possible recipe. So, for example, I'm going to say uh, potatoes, I want french fries. Um, do you have some ideas of things you want to, to try? <laughs> so I'll say it in, fr in English then. Snails. <laughs> the name of the dish itself, what would it be? Uh, um, I don't know how to say that in English. Uh, you can do a gratin d'escargot. Uh, snails. No, I, I won't be able to say it. Uh, let, let me try something else. Um, uh, Apple, it's going to be, a, let's say, an apple pie. Um, what? Nothing in a nice house. 
Sorry, I didn't get it. Gasoline. Okay. So I wasn't sure I understood, but... Uh, and then... Napalm. Really? Okay. Why not? And then... Uh, <laughs> it's kind of surprising. Then I write my input. <laughs> no, I'm not sure what I'm going to try there. Um, no, something like banana. Hopefully it's going to say uh, not na napalm banana or something, but banana bread or... Usually it says like banana bread if I use that. <laughs> but the fact that I added that... No, banana bread. <sighs> I don't want to, you know, kill anyone with my recipes. So honestly, so this is a bit of a stupid example because I'm sure that if I hadn't given examples of inputs and outputs, it probably would have given me a, a recipe, right? But if I hadn't done that, framed that way, it would have given me the whole recipe, uh, like with all the, the steps, the ingredients, etc. So that way, it's a way to uh, steer the model into replying with just a, the name of the recipe or a particular format. For example, if my output was just JSON, it would just reply with JSON. So it's a way to uh, encourage and ask politely to the LLM, please reply in a certain manner. All right, so uh, we saw um, Bard, uh, Gemini, Palm, Maker Suite, but um, if you look at what's available online, you'll see lots of content with uh, Python demos, frameworks, etc. But I'm a Java developer, and I don't want to use Python for my application. And just to, to give a few, a couple numbers, if you think about it, uh, there are, I think, 3 million Python developers, uh, but there are more than 10 million Java developers. And today, enterprise applications are mostly written by Java developers in Java. So I want to integrate LLMs into my applications, but I want to do that in Java. So uh, six months ago, we were told at Google, yeah, everybody should be doing something with generative AI. So I started learning more about it, and I built my first application, which is uh, Bedtime Stories. So it's a, an application to, uh, so let me show the demo here, uh, an application to generate uh, kid stories. So you can pick up a character, you can pick up um, like a, um, the, the settings, like where it's taking place, in which uh, time frame, etc., and a plot, what's going to happen. So I gave some examples here, but I can define my own uh, things. So let's say uh, a kid story about, about a, um, a Java developer. Oh, super story. Um, taking place uh, on the hmm, JFocus space station. And what's happening? Um, discover, maybe discovering uh, <laughs> cats uh, in space with uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, capabilities. No, I don't know, because a cat is a cat intelligent? Mine isn't always intelligent, but never mind. So let's see what it's going to generate. Um, so I'm using the, the bigger Palm, I think in this demo that's Palm, with a bigger context window so that I can generate a bigger stories. So it takes uh, like 15 seconds to generate something a bit long. And uh, in a few seconds, it's going to do something. So I won't read everything, but Let's see what it does. Hey, come on. Usually it's 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, it's a bit long, to be honest. Dun -dun -dun, suspense. And I can't do the trick with the dark screen all the time, you know. So. Hey, but it's it weirdly slow. Oh, no, sorry, it's there. All right, so um, on the Jeff Focus Space Station, a brilliant Java developer named Anya. Uh, she didn't know much about life, fateful day, what's happening, curiosity, uh, discovered a startling sight, a group of cats, not ordinary felines, but cats with artificial intelligence capabilities. So that's the, what we had in our plot. So, um, well, she did a spacewalk, what's happening there, uh, and he had turned to the cats for help. Wow, that's cool. And the cats became an integral part of the Jeff Focus community. Welcome, cats! <laughs> All right. 
So that, that's about it. So that, that was my first application. Uh, back in the day, more than six months ago, there wasn't a, a Java API uh, that I could use. So instead, I used the REST API. And let me show you that. I created, so this is uh, this demo here. So I created um, a Micronaut application because I like uh, the Micronaut framework very much. I used Groovy in that example, but the other one uh, will be in Java. Uh, I containerized my uh, Micronaut application and I deployed that on Google Cloud Run. It's a container um, hosting solution on Google Cloud. You just give it a container and it's going to scale up and down. It's serverless, it doesn't cost you anything if it's not running, etc. Pay per use. And so you remember the HTML page then. When the, the person clicks on the little button, I'm going to call my controller. Uh, so await fetch slash story slash slash generate, which is going to call my story maker controller, which is there. So it's a micro controller, which replies to slash story. And the method is somewhere here, uh, slash story slash generate. It takes as argument a character, a setting, a plot. And so there, there are a few things that I've defined. So I'm authenticating with the, the Google authentication library because I need a, a bearer token to pass to, to the API. I'm preparing a URL to point at the model. And then that's where I feed the actual data that I need. So I'm going to um, get the prompt in there. And the prompt, it's, uh, it's a template string in, in Groovy. So it's uh, like the new string template stuff in, in Java, I forget the number. And I have my prompt here. So you're a creative and passionate storyteller for kids, etc. You have to structure the story in different acts with a, you know, the climax and, and everything. And then generate a kid story in five acts, 20 sentences per act with that character, where it takes place, the plot. And then I just call with the, the API with that prompt, parameterized prompt. And I give you some extra parameters, like the temperature, how creative I want the story to, to be, number of tokens I want to generate, etc. And then it's going to return uh, some data structures that I'm unmarshalling with uh, Micronaut. So the prediction response will contain um, like a list of predictions, if there are several predictions and not just one that's generated, which contains the content. And also some safety attribute, like if I try to generate a, um, you know, something violent, something pornographic or something, it would be uh, blocked automatically by the, the LLM. And I just return that uh, back to the front end uh, as JSON, and then uh, it adds the, the data in, the, uh, in the, the, the text area. So that was my first demo. But then, um, fortunately, we added a, a Java SDK, which is auto-generated and is not very friendly to use. But fortunately, the fine folks of the Longchain 4J uh, orchestrator framework, open source framework, uh, integrated uh, both Palm and Gemini, the embedding models, etc. And there's an integration there for me to use in my Java application. So I decided to use. So Longchain is inspired from the Longchain project, which is for Python and TypeScript developers. But if you take Longchain, convert that into Java with a cup of coffee you're getting a nicer, much nicer logo, honestly, than the long chain itself, because you've got a parrot uh, drinking coffee. And long chain has got lots of uh, different components, like access to vector uh, databases, uh, how to deal with prompts, with the different models, and there are abstractions around all this, and it makes things much easier. And I'm going to show you a second demo, which is, so um, I, I told you that I, the, the co-founder of the Apache Groovy project, there's hundreds of pages of documentation for the Groovy language. And I wanted to apply something you've probably heard of as well, the retrieval augmented generation pattern or approach, which is the fact of uh, helping the LLM ground its answers with your own documents, your own information, your, your own data. So let me explain how it works. There are two phases, or maybe I could show you, no, well, I'll show you first the diagram. There's an ingestion phase where you prepare the documentation and then the querying phase where the users do the queries. So first, you start with the documentation. You're going to split that documentation into chunks, small parts like paragraphs, sentences, etc. And then we are going to calculate the vector embeddings, or those big multidimensional vectors for the, the, the chunks of text. 
We are going to store that, both the vector and the, the snippet of text, the chunk, into a vector database. So that's the first phase of ingestion. Then your user comes, and he's got, the, the, the user is going to, to make a query, how you do this and that. We're going to do the same process. We're going to calculate a vector embedding for the question. And the thing is, uh, we, we said that similar vectors carry the same semantics or meaning. And we are going to find similar vectors, similar to the query, inside the vector database. And the answer is likely going to be in those snippets of text. So what's the next step? We take the most relevant snippets with the closest vectors. We put that in the context, in the prompt. We say, OK, you're um, an expert uh, Apache Groovy developer. Uh, here's the query from the user. You should base your answer on the documentation uh, that, that you have, the extracts that you have in the prompt, and then it's going to answer. So if you look at this, uh, oops, in the demo here. So I create a little chatbot interface. So for example, um, can I uh, create records in Groovy? And uh, yes, because uh, Groovy uh, adopts all the uh, features uh, of Java in addition to the stuff that it's doing. And uh, so let's see, can you create records in Groovy? And yes, you can create records and a record. So it just looks like the, the Java record. And yeah, record person, etc. Or, well, it, it'll even explain things like the, um, it's, uh, even if you use a version of the JDK that doesn't support records, uh, you can piggyback and have records-like stuff uh, as well. So that's pretty cool. And let me, so I can ask further questions, etc. Let me show you how I implemented that. Uh, this is this window. So again, I containerized my Micronaut application written in Java, but this time I'm using Longchain4j in this application. So the front end calls slash query, slash, yeah, just slash query, and I post um, like the query as well as the ID of the conversation so that each user has their own conversation thread going on. And I inject my little service class, which is here. Uh, maybe I can, oops, I wanted to increase the font size a little bit. Um, so I define a few things there. With uh, Longchain4j, you can use different kind of builders to create, and it's a higher level of abstraction, so different models uh, follow the same or implement the same interfaces. So I can even switch models uh, in my application. Here I'm going to say I need an embedding model to calculate the vector embeddings. Then I'm going to use to define the Gemini chat model, I'm using a Gemini Pro with a certain temperature. And uh, I'll skip the details about the ingestion process, but uh, here I'm going to say I want to load an in-memory vector database that contains the, all the excerpts of my uh, documentation. So this is where I actually uh, load that in memory. And then I define a retriever. The retriever will uh, create a relationship between the vector database and the embedding model, so that when you ask queries, it's going to use the embedding model to search into the vector database. I create a prompt template, though the information and questions placeholders will be replaced with the actual uh, information. What's next? Here I'm defining a special uh, memory, a chat memory, to keep the latest messages in the conversation. And the big important part is here. I'm going to create a chain, a chain that's going to bind the chat model, the Gemini chat model, the memory, the template that I want to use, and the retriever, say you're going to uh, replace the information bits there by the results you find in the vector database. And then I just need to say chain execute query, and it's going to keep up with the, um, the session chats, with uh, the previous questions that were asked, etc., and fetch the relevant information from the vector database. So it's fairly trivial to do, honestly, to implement such a thing. And um, in the latest version, that's why it's in yellow, orangish color, uh, there's, there are even more powerful retrieval chains and uh, those ones are now deprecated, so I need to update the code to use the latest and greatest ways to build uh, retrieval chains and conversational chains. 
Right, so uh, I think I'll uh, stick there. Or maybe one last demo because I've got just one minute, which is uh, I like this. Um, there's a, a card game that I'm playing with my uh, kids. Uh, so it's an unfinished demo because it doesn't work properly well. But I want to show you that you can do um, a multimodal uh, example. You take a picture and you have to count the numbers uh, on the cards. So it takes a bit of time, but uh, it's got, so I've got a prompt that says, hey, look at the cards and the number, and I want to know the numbers because the, you have to add all the points together to get um, like the number of points, and the lower the points, uh, the, the, the winner is. So it misses a few cards here, six, six, three, it missed uh, a few. I, I still I noticed that it's very sensitive to the prompt that I use. And if I used a uh, few shot prompting with examples of cards, it would probably do better. So I, I still need to refine that demo. It's not really ready for prime time. <coughs> Sorry. But just for the sake of showing you that, really, you define a, a, a model, the, again, the Gemini model. You define a prompt. And basically, you, you pass it the Im image content and the text content. And it's able to do both text and images as input and give answers. So that's about it um, for the, this uh, demo. Um, Palm and Gemini are very powerful models that can use and easily integrate into your Java applications today. Um, before, it wasn't as easy because you had to use the REST API or Verbose uh, protobuf kind of APIs in Java, but now with integrations like Longchain 4J or the Gemini SDK that I helped to develop, it's much nicer to use and integrate with those models in Java. And especially Longchain 4J is a really top-notch framework today uh, if you want to uh, build LLM-based apps in Java. So that's about it. Thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, I'm not, I don't think I can take questions or... You, you can I take one yeah, or two? Okay, yeah, so... You come, come down to, to your mom. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank so you. It,